So, uh, good afternoon, and uh, welcome again to Dev Days. Uh, my name is Ben Jackson, and I work on VR at Valve, uh, primarily on tracking-related topics. And so uh, today I want to talk to you about Lighthouse. I mean, uh, Steam VR tracking. You've heard us call it uh, by the name Lighthouse a lot of times in the past, but it's the same thing. Uh, so I'm going to give you an overview and tell you why I think we, that you should use it. And uh, then I'll give you an update on the technology and what we've been doing to improve it. And uh, we'll talk about how we're going to get it in the hands of more people. So this is a system. The core components here are the base station, the sensors on the object, the electronics, the tracked object electronics inside, and the host software. And the data flows through that whole system in the same way. So originates at the base, talks to the sensors, to the electronics, and then up to the host. So we haven't really talked publicly about how these pieces fit together and how some of them work, so I want to show you some of that today. So this is the first link in the chain. It's the base station. Uh, it generates all the signals that we use to do tracking. And, uh, and that makes it critical to the quality of the system. And it's also the key to compatibility, to make sure that any controller or HMD you want to use can work together. Now it plugs into your wall, not into your PC. And uh, the reason that's important is because everybody uh, in view of the base can share it. <coughs> It operates, uh, every, every object can operate standalone in that space. And it has a really wide field of view. 120 degrees is so wide that even if you just mount it near the corner of your room, it can reach out to both walls, all the way to the ceiling, all the way down to the floor. And that's something that's challenging for something like a camera lens, but it's easy for a rotor spinning with laser lines. And the narrow laser lines maintain great resolution even out to the edge of the room. So here are your key components. Uh, the sync blinker, which is an array of LEDs, which is going to make a global flash I'll talk to you about. Uh, the rotor, uh, which is spinning at 60 hertz. And, then, and when you look at it now, you see a spot I've called the laser spot. And that's actually part of a line, which I'll show you. So the rotor turns at 60 hertz. And that means that line is going pretty fast uh, when you get out near the edge of the room. So if you go out to 5 meters, you do the math, 60 hertz, it's moving at 2,000 meters per second at the end of the room. So a lot faster than you are, which is what lets us track you. So I want to emphasize again why it's important that uh, everybody who's participating in SteamVR tracking as an object uh, is standalone. That, that autonomy is, is the object knowing where it is by receiving the shared information, but not having to coordinate with anybody else. And, and that's why SteamVR is a great fit for backpack PCs, which don't have to be connected to anything, including the base. It's a great fit for mobile VR for the same reason. And the scalability means that everybody using the volume uh, can share the tracking. All right, so you can see those features I talked about inside your own base. Uh, if you look at it with something that can see in infrared, so a lot of you probably have a cell phone camera that can do it. Uh, night vision goggles work too, if you have those. And uh, as you move around the room, uh, you'll see those spots kind of follow you like eyes in a painting. And that's because you only see the spot when the rotor happens to be facing in your direction. So if you're doing that experiment with your phone, go ahead and take a picture. Uh, and if you analyze the picture, you could look and see where's the spot on the rotor? Uh, how close is it to the edge? And if you measured that, then you would know what your bearing was to the base station because it's moving back and forth, just like this, this guy's demonstrating here. Now, you have the advantage in that experiment of being able to see the entire rotor, which lets you judge where the point is coming out of the rotor. But the sensors are much simpler. They can only see the flash of light. So they have to use a different technique to figure out which direction the rotor is pointing when they see that flash. And that's, that's through timing, and we'll talk about that. Uh, but the result is the same. So another way you can visualize this uh, is that it's an arc of laser light that's forming a line 
in this case projected on the wall, and of course because 120 degrees is so wide, well above and below the wall. And so you are seeing the spot at the moment that the line crosses your eye, or you know, the camera lens if you're using your cell phone camera. So on the left you're, you're seeing there the, the beam is frozen in time at the moment that it's crossing your eye. And so this is what's actually happening for us to do tracking. One beam sweeps across you, and then the other beam sweeps across you. And when you're looking at it, uh, it's so fast that you just see a constant spot. But again, because we're using timing, we can use that sweep to figure out uh, where the rotor is when you're hit. So let me show that again for anybody who didn't get to see it. So this slide gets a little technical. Uh, it's, it's here to satisfy your curiosity if you want more detail. Uh, over there on the left, we have a timing diagram that shows what happens for one rotor sweeping across the room. So the first thing that happens is the sync blinker, which is that array of LEDs, flashes brightly, and that means that it's something that everything in the room can see, and that lets them start their clock. And I've drawn the rotor just below it. That's a top-down view. That flash happens when the rotor, uh, when the laser is actually pointing sideways into the side of the case, um, and we call that zero degrees. And now the, the rotor is turning, and as it, as it hits about 30 degrees and it's able to emerge from the case, it turns on, the line sweeps across the room, just like you saw on the last slide, and it hits any sensors that are visible. And so I made a little line along the bottom there that shows, uh, <coughs> you know, at zero degrees, we get that flash to mark our start position, and then based on time, because the rotor is turning at a constant rate, time and angle are equivalent. So the rotor turns, uh, passes across those sensors, we record the timing, and then that gives us the angle that we need. And I've made up some numbers down there, but you can see they're really close together. And that's reasonable because the object is fairly small from the perspective of the base station when it's far out in the room. And because of that, we need a lot of precision in those angular measurements in order to be able to tell what's going on. Uh, and that's why we need high timing precision. So that's just one axis of one base. Each base has two axes. And so this happens twice for a given base. And then if you're using two, they are taking turns and one will flash and sweep and flash and sweep, and then the other one will get a chance to flash and sweep and flash and sweep, and back and forth. So what are the advantages to this system? Well, one is that our accuracy is only limited by how well we can time things. So a camera has a sensor, sensor has pixels, uh, and, and you start to hit limits to how much you can resolve with that. But the, li the line is actually sweeping in a continuous way, like an analog continuous way across the room. And so all we have to do is be able to measure that precisely. And there are a lot of things that go into that. It's not just the electronics, but also how well the sensors can turn light into pulses. Another great thing is that our range uh, is only limited uh, by how bright we can make everything and then how accurately we can time pulses. And so the five meter range is a trade-off uh, for you know, reasonable brightness and accuracy. But as many of you probably know, it, the light keeps going uh, and uh, some bases can be used at even greater range. So again, autonomy, we have unlimited users and objects because the base is really just a reference. It's sort of like an artificial feature that we're tracking and it's just sitting there making signals and everybody is receiving them. Uh, and the other one is uh, maybe not as obvious and that is that the sensors identify themselves. So when they get hit by light, uh, the sensor says, hey, I'm sensor seven, I just got hit by some light. And we know exactly who got hit. Whereas if it's an LED that's lighting up, you see it and then you have to be like, well, which, which LED is that? Um, and so your hand in particular can move really fast, can move in and out of occlusion, it can rotate. And as soon as something comes into view, we're gonna be able to tell what sensor got hit uh, because they're identifying themselves. So, once we have all that data, we got to get all the angles and all the IMU data and low latency into the host, which we can do with USB or wireless. And then our driver crunches that data and it puts the pose information into the system through the same OpenVR driver API uh, that's available to everyone. So good tracking is a big responsibility in VR. You know, your eyes are essentially doing inside out tracking all the time. You're looking at things and that's how you know where you are. So when we replace your world with a virtual world, we're wrapping your tracking system with our tracking system. And that's why we spend so much time working on lenses, panels, 
helping people make frame rate and great tracking because in room scale VR, that's a chain and the chain is only as strong as its weakest link. So I want to give you an update. Let's take a look at those components and uh, talk about how far we've come and where we're planning to go. So these are the things that we're keeping in mind uh, you know, when we're working on VR. Obviously, we want to make everything better. I mean, accuracy is a big part of that. Accuracy is sort of like a, a currency that we can use. Uh, and we can spend that currency to get more range or smaller objects. Uh, we're trying to make standard components available. So we want to make sure that uh, all of the interesting specialized parts that are required to make SteamVR tracking work are, are readily available. Now, we're going as fast as we can, uh, but we know that we'll never be as fast as everybody, uh, and so that's why we're trying to get everybody else involved. And, uh, and finally, of course, we're always thinking about how to bring VR uh, to a wider audience. So let's start where the signals start, with the base stations. Joe, uh, I think, showed you a family portrait in the keynote, and so uh, well, let's take a peek inside each one. So this is essentially the first base station we made that looks like the base station you know today. We had bench prototypes uh, that looked like hard drive sawed in half and glued together. Um, but once we realized it was going to work, we needed something that was a little more attractive. Um, and so these were hand machined by Valve employees. Uh, you might recognize that these are just a couple of like aluminum tube sections sawed in half and nested together. Hand turned brass rotors. You can see the spot, the, the li line spreader there that produces the line. Uh, and we made these with, with surplus parts. Uh, a lot of them came from eBay. Uh, you, might, you might not know this, but hard drive motors don't come as individual motors anymore. They're actually uh, integrated right into the drive. So for this, we had to go way back on eBay, buy old stock of, of hard drive motors from hard drives that have long been discontinued. Uh, we know that there probably are only about 50 of these because we gave everyone a name. Uh, there were 26 boys and about 26 girls. Uh, and when I started on the project, uh, I think there were about five, and every, everybody knew the names, they all had individual personalities. <laughs> uh, and people still remember uh, certain bases today. I can tell you that the, the one named Jody was the one that sat over my desk for a very long time while I was initially working on the tracking system. Uh, so you'll recognize the parts that we saw uh, inside the diagram earlier. Uh, the inverted L shape is a sync blinker, and that is nine Osram Platinum Dragon LEDs. Uh, they're infrared, so they didn't look like much, maybe a little pink dot if you saw them, but these are the kind of LEDs where one makes a lot, one of those ultra-bright flashlights that you can barely bear to look into. So, of course, we used nine. Because <laughs> we really didn't know how bright it needed to be, and like I said, range is brightness, so we erred on the side of super bright. Um, but at the time, like, each of those was $10, so you can see that it's, it's not a cost-effective way to build a base. And an interesting thing about these was that they were actually pretty good uh, and that, that turned out actually to be a problem because we didn't learn as much as we might have if, if they hadn't been as well made. But they were made by hand, with care, by people who knew what was important. Uh, and so when we, when we moved on to scale up uh, and we asked Synapse to build about 400, you can see it's obviously based on the same plan. You can recognize the, the same section, um, same sort of boards, but uh, you know, refined a little bit. We made about 400 of these and hand calibrated them. And now is where we started really learning about, you know, what, is it, what does it take to, to reach uh, uh, volume manufacturing? Uh, so if, uh, if you developed any content uh, for GDC 2015, you probably got one of these along with a 3D printed headset that you were working with. And then these were used uh, in GDC 2015 in the demo booths uh, where we revealed the Vive. Uh, and, and at the time, there were seven demo booths, there were 14 bases that were deemed good enough, and a handful of spares that were ranked in order of preference, uh, starting with, please don't use this, and going down. <laughs> <laughs> so for our next uh, step, oh yes, and I, I should say, we used up all the motors and the lasers that we bought from eBay, so we weren't going to keep building these. This is the base uh, that we call Robin. Uh, and it shipped in the dev kit that we shipped to everybody in 2015. And I know a lot of you probably got one of those, and uh, so you know that we had some growing pains with those. Uh, and we just had to stop tweaking them and, and ship them out to you so you could start making content. Uh, so at this point, um, 
we were now using off-the-shelf parts, but maybe not as ideally suited. Um, and, and, and in parallel, we're developing the custom parts that we know that we're going to need. So, you know, if we're right about where our VR is going, if, uh, if it's going to be huge and you've got one of these, you should hang on to it because it's, it's going to be a collector's item. So finally, uh, the Vive shipped uh, with base with uh, all custom parts, you know, a custom motor designed for the application, uh, custom lasers, custom optics, and obviously many thousands of those uh, have been made. Uh, but if you thought it was a pretty big leap uh, from that little Robin base station to the HTC base station, that's because it was actually based on our uh, internal research platform, which I'm showing you here. And this is what we use to try new things. Uh, and you can see we've even milled a little bit on this one. Uh, and this is where we want to, you know, use this platform to bring it full circle, to, to turn the custom parts that we're making into standard parts uh, that anybody can order. And, uh, and with this model, I want to show you something today that we've been working on. Uh, you might have noticed that uh, there's a whole rotor missing and that the, uh, the reason that we've machined the case and moved it down is so that we can fit that single rotor that has two line spreaders. And it turns out that uh, one rotor is actually all you need. And, you know, what better way to make it lighter, quieter, cheaper, more power efficient than to chop out half the parts. All right, so get out your night vision goggles or your cell phone again. Uh, now I'm going to blow your mind uh, when you look at what happens when you look at a single rotor. Yeah. I can, I can really say that uh, I did not fully appreciate this until I literally did the experiment we're describing, which is we made a single rotor and I looked at it through night vision goggles. Uh, so I might present it to you here like, well, obviously this happens, but uh, uh, it wasn't super obvious. And, and so here's what the lines are actually doing uh, as they go across you. So it's sort of a V uh, that sweeps past. So I'll, let me run that again so you can see it. So you can imagine a V that sweeps past. So as you go up, your apparent uh, position of one starts to move to the left and the other starts to move to the right. And if this guy moved side to side, you'd see they'd move together. Uh, so that's one way to appeal to your intuition about how it works. Uh, let me give you another option. So here's another way to think about it. Uh, in a two rotor base, we have access information provided by one rotor plus the other rotor, and that makes a, a coordinate system. And, and in a two rotor base, uh, we get those two axes by combining information from the two V-shaped lines. So you can imagine that your, your horizontal information is coming from sort of a, a point that's halfway between the two lines, no matter where you are. And then your vertical position, you can infer from the distance between the two lines as you see them. So the next step in our travels is the sensors. So this is what we call a discrete sensor. So that means that it was built out of discrete components, individual parts, and there are about 40 of those parts in that uh, sensor that you see. We call that the gum stick because of its shape. Uh, and they're responsible for uh, receiving light, amplifying it, filtering out unwanted signals, and then generating a clean pulse that we can use for timing. And you can tell from the silk screen on that board, probably it's projected big enough here, that it's uh, from October of 2014. Electrical engineers love to put dates on uh, PCBs, so always handy. And uh, at the bottom, what you see is the same design uh, and just transposed into an early Vive prototype. Now, if you got a dev kit uh, in 2015, then you got 70 of the gum stick controllers between the two Mr. Hats and the prototype HMD. So you do the math, uh, 70 times 40 is 2,800, and that's a lot of parts. Uh, so we've got to do better than that. And so uh, we've been working on a sensor ASIC. Uh, an ASIC, for those of you who aren't familiar, is an application-specific integrated circuit. So in other words, it's custom silicon. And it combines the functions of most of the parts that you saw on the previous slide into one chip, and it does it better. <coughs> so, you might ask, why don't people use ASICs for everything? Uh, well, that's because uh, some people are laughing who know the answer. Uh, it takes a long time and it's really expensive uh, to make the first ASIC, but the payoff is that your design is simplified and the additional incremental parts can be very cheap. So uh, if you haven't spotted it yet, uh, it's the small square down there. Uh, and uh, there are only nine other components on that board. So uh, these are obviously tiny chips. Um, 
there's not a lot of room to put information on them. And uh, originally we were given four letters uh, to designate the part, so we chose hats. <laughs> we liked the idea that your VR hat was full of hats, but uh, <laughs> unfortunately uh, the early rev of silicon that said hats uh, was quickly obsoleted by something new. So this is the TS3633 light to digital converter for Steam VR tracking. And to give you a sense of how small it is, this is the board from the previous slide <laughs> at the same scale. Scale might look the same because you see some discrete components on the blue board in the back, but those are actually just much larger discrete components. So one of our key partners in this effort is Triad Semiconductor, and uh, we've been iterating with them since 2014 uh, to make an ASIC that can meet or exceed uh, the capabilities of the discrete uh, version that you saw earlier. And it's really uh, a credit to Alan Yates that it's taken this long to best his original analog design. And this is going to be one of those, uh, those uh, off-the-shelf components that I talked about making available to everyone. So at the bottom of the slide, you can see both sides of the TS3633 here. Next to the profile of one US dime, uh, and, and that is what is called a 3x3 three three WLCSP, uh, a wafer level chip scale package, which is a fancy way to say that they've just cut a little square right out of the silicon wafer, 1.6 millimeters on a side, which is about the same size as the D in dime. So get out your dimes when you get home. Uh, that's our website, triadsemi.com, and if you go there now, uh, you can look at the data sheet for this part. Um, there's sample uh, schematics, uh, and you can buy them right there. So let's move on to the next part. Once, once we get signals from the uh, sensors, then we pass them on to the tracked object electronics to get timing. So this is a board that we call Watchman. Uh, this is version one. Every sensor on there has an individual connection. Uh, and you can see those around the perimeter of the board. And we've used this many times to prototype HMDs and controllers. And if you had an opportunity to use the wired controller that we showed at GDC 2015, uh, it had uh, one of these boards in each hat, along with a whole bunch of carefully folded little wires going to every individual sensor. So the, the major chips on there, uh, you know, roughly in order from largest to smallest, are the FPGA, uh, which connects to all of those individual connectors and captures all the timing data. Uh, which passes it on to the MCU, uh, which has USB, to return it to the host. And then there's an IMU, uh, which we use for sensor fusion. And as I say on the slide there, this, this was a pretty good design for HMDs, because you could put it flat in the front, and then the wires spread out, and that pretty much matches what an HMD looks like. It's not very good uh, for prototyping controllers, because most of your sensors are kind of in the same place. So we moved on to version two. This is what we mass produced. So if you got a dev kit uh, in 2015, you got three of these. Um, there was one in each tracking hat and uh, one in the front of the faceplate. So it, it powered uh, the Vive V0 and V1 uh, dev kit HMDs. It's an incremental improvement. Uh, most of those chips are basically the same chips that you just saw, uh, maybe, maybe slight upgrades. So it's the same core. And it's switched for manufacturing purposes from having a bunch of individual connectors to three connectors, which can connect 11 sensors each. And that was you know, much better for manufacturing, but it makes this a poor platform for prototyping. And it still uh, only does tracking. Because if you look at that silhouette over there on the right, that's the Mr. Hat controller. And it actually had three discrete boards in it. At the top, you see lying down flat is the Watchman V2 from the previous slide. And it connected by a ribbon cable to a little board in the neck, which was the radio, which connected by a ribbon cable to a board in the handle, which provided all the controller functionality. And that was a lot of firmware originating from a lot of different projects at Valve. And uh, you know, if you experienced that, you know that it, it was a little too complicated. Uh, but it was fast. Uh, it was modular in that sense. Um, but what we really wanted was to combine it all into one smaller form factor, which combined all the tracking uh, the radio and controller input. We knew we needed to do that uh, you know, before we could open it up to other people. So this is Watchman V3. Uh, it's tiny, obviously. Uh, it's an upgrade to everything. It's a pretty big upgrade to everything. So it goes from like a Cortex-M0 to a Cortex-M4. 
Uh, it adds a radio. It adds all the I.O. that you need uh, to do a controller. It's got you know, support for haptics, uh, support for trackpad, buttons, uh, and, bu and a bunch of extra I.O. It's small enough uh, that it will fit in a controller handle, so if you use it for prototyping, um, it's not ungainly. Uh, and this is the board that's going to power the, the hardware dev kit, which I'll show you later. So we've talked about the hardware. Uh, so let's talk about what we're doing to open up uh, SteamVR tracking to new ideas and new applications. So as I said before, the base stations are critical uh, to tracking quality. Uh, and they are also the key to system compatibility. And, and that is why uh, we're not able to broadly license them to people now, because we, we're just not ready for that. Uh, but we know that everybody is going to need base stations in their system. And so we are going to manufacture a base that we can OEM to partners of all scales who want to use them. Uh, now, right now, <coughs> if you need an individual base, uh, they are available uh, retail from HTC, and they're all compatible. A sensor story is particularly easy. Uh, you can just go to triadsemi.com, right at the top, put in your quantity, hit order, and get yourself some sensors. And we have internet right now, if, if anybody. <laughs> so for objects, uh, I want to talk to you about uh, the class that we put together. So I, I hope it, that you're, if you're at this talk, uh, that it comes as no surprise to you uh, that we uh, have this license offering. Uh, it's a click-through license for people to use SteamVR tracking in their own products. Uh, it's, there's no upfront fee and there's no royalty fee. Uh, and it's been a big success. We've had uh, over 300 companies sign up. Now we don't have a certification program. You can build whatever you want. We just want it to be compatible with SteamVR. Uh, and right now we do ask that licensees take a class. Uh, and that has really accelerated our plans uh, to get the technology out there. Uh, because like everything we do at Valve, we want to iterate and make things better. Uh, so right now, uh, for example, the dev kits are just being completed in time for each class, and, and we're working to scale that up. Uh, we're incorporating the feedback from the early classes, making the class better. Uh, and when all that comes together, when we're able to make dev kits uh, in quantity, then we'll be able to open it up. So I don't want you to feel like the class is holding you back. Um, there are over 100 slots available uh, between now and the end of the year. And if you all sign up right now, uh, we can go make more slots available. We've had about 40 people go through already, and the feedback has been really positive. And we can uh, schedule private classes if you want to a, bring a big group or if you have uh, confidential products that you want to talk about, do some show and tell, get some advice. So our partner um, for developing the class and the documentation is Synapse. They're just down the street here in Seattle. Uh, and you've heard me mention their name in conjunction with uh, the base station and the electronics. Uh, so they've developed a reference object uh, for the class. And they've taken that all the way from initial one-off prototypes uh, through tooling to uh, make kits in a volume uh, to serve the class. And so they've done everything that they're going to be teaching you how to do. Uh, so they're eminently qualified to give you good advice. And, as, and if there's one person uh, at Synapse that you want to know uh, when it comes to CMVR tracking, it's Doug Burry. Uh, he's done an excellent job of putting together the documentation in the class. Uh, he smoothed over a lot of the rough edges and the tools that we provided. Uh, and uh, frankly, he's probably doing a better job at teaching people how to build tracked objects than we would. Uh, he's a super nice guy. Uh, the patient of the saint. So if you see Doug uh, wandering around the hall here, uh, definitely say hi. So let's talk about uh, what, what the class is going to cover. So it's going to start off uh, with a much deeper dive into the technology. You know, we skimmed the surface today, and, uh, and we're going to go much deeper. Um, it's going to talk about how to design a tracked object. So, the shape is important. The base shape that you, the fundamental shape that you choose to start with, um, will impact the quality a lot. And we're going to talk about how you make those choices. And then uh, we've got both tools uh, to help you generate the shape, to extract metadata from, you know, plugins to extract metadata from CAD programs, and tools to help you do sensor placement once you have a shape. 
So there's a tool that will suggest where you can put the sensors. There's a tool which can evaluate a placement if you want to make manual changes. And uh, it's pretty good. Uh, it's going to give you a strong idea of uh, whether the thing that you want to make is actually going to work before you even try to build it. Uh, we'll talk about covering. Um, it's, a, it's a tricky topic. Obviously, uh, when you got the dev kits, you saw a lot of bare sensors. And uh, you know, for commercial product, you want to cover those up. There's uh, some interesting uh, challenges there that we'll talk about. Obviously, how to do rapid prototyping, how to test your object, how to calibrate it. You know, when you, when you make a mechanical assembly, there are stack up issues. When you glue a sensor into a hole, it can shift around. And to track it, we need to know uh, much more accurately where it is. So uh, every object uh, is individually calibrated. And so that, that way, we know where the sensors are, down to about 100 micron. Uh, we'll, we'll teach you how to make a render model. Uh, that's what makes your object uh, visible uh, when you're in the, in, uh, uh, in the white room, for example. Uh, how to evaluate tracking and recognize problems. Obviously, we'll, we'll dive deeper into the electrical system, uh, the firmware, uh, and we'll give you an introduction uh, to the hardware development kit. So this is a class that is by engineers for engineers. It is really uh, an information-packed three days, and we encourage everyone to send a mechanical engineer, an electrical engineer, uh, to get the most out of it. And uh, if you can include somebody from your industrial design team, uh, that is great too. Um, that, that initial form that you choose is going to have a big impact on how it works. So it's best not to fall in love with something before you know whether it's going to work. And our tools will help you evaluate that really quickly. Um, and all, that, all, the, all the documentation tools are, are uh, in a package on Steam for people who are in the class, uh, and they're being updated every day. Now, once you go through the class, uh, you're going to have some questions. Uh, so once you attend the class, you're going to have posting access to this forum, but everybody can read it right now. Um, and you can get answers from other licensees. You can get answers from me and other people on the team at Valve. And you can get answers from the team at Synapse. So this is the reference hardware that uh, Valve is providing to class attendees. So it demonstrates the principles of sensor placement and covering, uh, and it lets you get started right away. I have one here. So it might be bigger than you expected, uh, and that's because at the back, it's hollow. Uh, this handle obviously comes off, as you can see in the picture there. And uh, with the handle removed, you can slip it over pretty much any existing HMD or any prototype that you might be working on. And in the class, you'll learn how to modify the configuration on this to describe the displays that you put on it so you can get right into VR. And of course, if you attach the handle, uh, you know, you can experiment with it as a controller. So inside uh, that tiny module, uh, it is a module that just plugs in. So once you've gotten all you can out of this object, you can also unplug it and use it in your own uh, designs. And uh, it's battery powered. It's, uh, it works both wireless and wired. Uh, and this will get you started. I can. I'll leave that here. So that the, the development kit you'll get uh, includes more than just this. It's got everything you need to, to build a prototype controller HMD, so extra sensors and that kind of thing. Uh, and we, like I said, we, we tried to support everything uh, in Watchman V3 with the firmware, so trackpads, haptics, buttons. Um, there are several quick prototyping options that are included uh, with the kit. So once you take the module, um, at, you know, inside the, uh, in the prototype object there, there's a, a special FPC, flexible PC board, that connects all the sensors and hooks directly to the module. But for prototyping, uh, we have something that looks more like the Watchman V1, where you snap the module on, and it's got connectors all around, so you can just build something up on your bench really quick. Uh, once, once that's working, uh, you can make your own fairly simple custom board to plug the module on. And, uh, and, and finally, uh, once you're ready to, to go to production, uh, you can use the design documentation that ships on Steam, uh, you know, all the schematics and uh, sample layout to incorporate the Watchman V3 design directly uh, into your own product. So I want to move on now uh, to talk about OpenVR. So whether you're building hardware or software, um, OpenVR is what you can use to connect what you're doing to what everybody else is doing. Um, so I want to talk about the difference between OpenVR and SteamVR. So what is OpenVR? It's, it's APIs on the top for applications, and it's APIs on the bottom for drivers. 
Uh, so when we started, we didn't know that we were going to make a tracking system that everybody would want to put in their hardware. So what we made was an architecture uh, where everybody could plug in, and we're just one driver among many. So between those two APIs, Steam VR is the runtime that ties both of those things together. So it provides services like versioning, which is an important one, that lets old and new drivers work with old and new applications. Uh, but it also provides a bunch of services like chaperone and reprojection and overlays and notifications, all the good stuff that you see in VR. Uh, and it has Steam integration. Uh, but the Steam integration in Steam VR is using the public APIs. So um, the same way that Steam shows up when you hit the system button, uh, same APIs are what lets Vive port appear beside there in Steam. Uh, and the interface is right there in GitHub uh, if you want to make something yourself. You, you might have tried some uh, third party launcher yourself. So a little something to help you remember. OpenVR is the bread in the Steam VR sandwich. So the nice thing about OpenVR is that it, it gets more interesting as people build on both ends. So there's a lot of content uh, available on Steam, uh, thanks to probably many of you here in the audience today. And that is running on, on uh, hardware that's powered by Steam VR tracking, uh, most, most notably the HTC Vive. Uh, but soon, more hardware from licensees, thanks to some of you in the room today. And it's running on other platforms. And I can't even give you a complete list of that uh, because I know that there are people who are out there working on drivers who aren't even talking to us uh, for HMDs that I haven't even seen yet, uh, which is great. Uh, so that's the, that's the power of openness. You can uh, build an HMD, you can write a driver, you can buy a copy of the blue, and you can experience a whale encounter in VR. You don't need our permission, and you, know, you don't even have to talk to us, although I hope you do. So to encourage people to write drivers, uh, we need an example. Uh, so we shipped a sample driver uh, for the venerable Razor Hydra, and that was quickly embraced uh, and extended. And I, I do want to give special thanks to Andras Bach, uh, who turned our example into a product, uh, and that helped us learn a lot about shipping third-party drivers on Steam and, uh, and how they install and operate. Uh, I think this really illustrates the, the power of OpenVR uh, well. I think Joe in his keynote uh, talked about a merry-go-round where everybody gives it a little push. And so the very day that um, I first had the Hydra driver working at home, I, I wanted to do a test uh, that would match what people were about to do with it. So I got a DK2, put it on, got out the Hydras, and I played Space Pirate Trainer. And I think I can say that that is the most fun I ever had with either Hydras or a DK2. Uh, and that was made possible because Hydra and, and DK2 got on the merry-go-round a while ago, and they made it spin a little faster. Then Vive came along, and HTC gave it a big push, and that made it worthwhile to make Space Pirate Trainer. And now everybody who's still on the merry-go-round uh, gets to benefit. Uh, and you know, I tried to Google uh, whether um, Space Pirate Trainer maybe happened to have been uh, developed early uh, with the Hydra, but it turned out I, I couldn't find any information about that because when you Google it, you get all articles of people talking about how much fun they're having uh, playing <laughs> Space Pirate Trainer with the Hydra. So if, if you're shipping a game on Steam right now, you know, the chances are that somebody's tried it with a Hydra or Leap Motion, uh, and you didn't have to lift a finger. Okay. So everything you need to, if you want to de develop drivers and applications uh, is on our GitHub. It's available with a standard uh, three-clause BSD license. Uh, it's also the place that you want to go you know, if you want to write an overlay, uh, if you want to write a plugin for the dashboard that's up there beside Steam, or you know, if you just want to do a research project and record all of the poses into a file. So this, this interface is how uh, Steam VR tracking is integrated. It's, it's how Steam is integrated. It's how Viveport is integrated. Um, and so if, if you have questions, uh, please ask them in the forum. Uh, we do see that. We do try to get the right people pointed at those to answer the questions. Uh, so obviously, uh, we're integrated in all the major game engines, uh, and you can get started now in VR in just a few minutes. And this is a huge topic uh, with all the different engines and plugins and the lab render, and I'm not really going to go into detail about that today. But I do want to say, you know, versioning is, is a big part of it. We want you to have confidence that your builds are going to keep working. 
because you know we know the pain of reviving an old build. Uh, and on the flip side, uh, we want to look into the future. When you hit build right now, you're making a game that's going to keep running um, on current hardware, but it's also going to run on hardware that hasn't been designed yet or is being designed by people in this room or by companies that don't even exist yet. And so, you know, we know we can't think of everything, but uh, if, you know, if you make a little effort up front, it can pay big dividends. Uh, so, you know, to anticipate what might happen with new hardware, for example, we have APIs that, that let you tell whether, uh, you know, the controller is in the left hand or the right hand because some hardware might lock that down. Um, we have render models so that your game, if it wants to show a representation of the controller, can just ask the API for a model and then it can show that model. Uh, and, you know, the models that we ship for things like the Vive are very detailed. All the parts can move. Um, we have all the coordinates of the buttons if you want to put arrows to them. I know it's more work than just importing the model and dragging a line over, but the great thing is if you do it, um, then your game is going to work on new hardware uh, pretty seamlessly. <coughs> so, uh, you know, we, we even continue uh, to support old platforms now. We, we support uh, both uh, 0 0.8 and the newer versions of the Oculus runtime as two different drivers uh, because it's easy for us and then that lets DK1 users keep playing. <coughs> so uh, if you have a custom driver, if you're building full custom hardware, you know, talk to us about shipping it on Steam. And that way customers get uh, one-click install and automatic updating. Uh, and, and we want that uh, same great story that we have for backwards compatibility for applications to also be true for drivers. And so please let us know if you're working on a, a custom driver and we ship something that breaks, preferably uh, while we're still in the beta, and then we can get it fixed really quick. So <clears throat> the other thing that's happening is that we are trying to include uh, you know, new technologies in the API. Uh, because finding a common ground for those new technologies means that developers uh, have a single target to aim for, uh, which is really powerful. And it also means that companies that build like equipment uh, can write a driver and target that API and get access immediately to all of the existing content that supports it. So, you know, we're talking to companies already that are doing things like hand tracking and eye tracking to find common ground. But if you're building something exotic, you know, definitely come and talk to us because uh, we want to give people a consistent target. And if we do it right, um, then that means that, you know, the games that are made today are going to continue to work with future hardware and that people who build hardware tomorrow are going to just inherit the whole library of content. So back at DevDays 2014, uh, when we showed you VR, uh, we showed you a lot of cubes. Uh, you stood on a cube, you stood inside a cube, uh, you stood uh, surrounded by cubes. I actually wrote most of the, the SteamVR tracking system using cubes just like the ones that you see there. Uh, I was pretty sure we were onto something when I leaned my head into a cube. And my brain said, hey, keep leaning. Your head will pop out of that cube, and you'll see Joe, who is sitting next to me in real life. Uh, but you, know, you don't have to design new hardware with programmer art anymore. Um, you know, if you use your controller and your HMD with real content, uh, you're going to get answers to questions that you didn't even know to ask. Uh, and some of those questions are going to send you right back to the drawing board. So we recommend that you start early, you know, bring up your driver in parallel, and play test with all the 600 titles that are on Steam. Uh, so that's my update, uh, and now it's your turn to let us know how we're doing. Uh, my email is benj at valvesoftware.com. So we hope that uh, Steam VR tracking, licensing it to everyone, uh, means that tracking is a solved problem in VR. But if we're wrong, uh, we've still got you covered um, because we have an architecture that welcomes all the hardware. So one last note, I encourage you to talk to each other. Uh, we've invited all of the licensees uh, to come to Dev Day. So a lot of the people probably in the audience and walking around the hall are actually hardware developers this year. Uh, and some of them are thinking about making a PC uh, peripherals or HMDs. Some of them are targeting vertical markets and want custom controllers for what they're trying to do. Um, so I encourage you, if, if you're making a game and there's something that you would want to see as a controller that would make your game better, uh, get out there. Talk to them, tell them what you want. Uh, and, and similarly, uh, you know, if, if you're working on hardware, a lot of developers here who are making interesting content that could really show off what you're doing, talk to them, uh, give them early access, uh, and get everybody involved. So that's why we have happy hour. We'll see you guys at five. Uh,
So thanks a lot for coming today, and I, I want to open it up for questions. Um, I think we have some time. <laughs> so there's a man with a microphone right here, and the gentleman in the front row is quick to raise his hand. You had a question as far as um, multiple lamp houses. So if we sure. wanted to... Uh, to have several of them together. Is that something that the current tech stack will support? And maybe you have to uh, change the duty cycle as far as how it alternates between the different ones for overlapping light? Okay. Or is that something that would be more in the future as far as different frequency spectrum and such sure. that might then reflect changes in ASICs and APIs? So I, I think people could hear the question. I don't need to repeat it, is that right? Uh, so the question is basically more lighthouses uh, all at once, more than two. Uh, and whether the current tech supports it. Uh, and yes, a lot of the tech uh, does support it, and uh, you know, we've just been focused on uh, you know, delivering what we think is, is the, uh, the best home VR system that we can right now, but definitely have a lot of plans in the works for that. So I, I don't have anything specific to announce um, you know, about like, which specific technologies are required, but all of those things that you mentioned come into play, uh, you know, improved sensors, frequency modulation, all those things are going on. Another another front row gentleman. Yeah. Oh, do we have? Oh, I'm sorry. We have a line forming in the middle. If behind, you find. The, uh, in the middle. Um, dude, we're all huge fans. It's been an outstanding talk uh, in every way. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. And I love where you guys are going. Um, definitely exploring the, the different types of controllers. I know a lot of us um, are kind of into the gun controllers, right? And there is I've <laughs> seen uh, yeah. the Armory. I don't know if you guys are out here. I definitely want to meet those guys. Uh, what are the plans for the gu gun? Uh, I know like PlayStation has like the AIM controller. What, what are we, uh, and especially standardization, what is? What ah, for so standardization like? for guns. So I guess, um, I'll, you know, like I said, 300 people have signed up uh, and, um, you know, I'm going to respect uh, their confidentiality. So um, I, I guess I can't really talk about their plans. I want to let them announce their plans. Uh, I can say in general, though, um, I know that, uh, that tracked guns are, are something that's uh, of a lot of interest. Uh, and I don't know if you're a game developer, or just a big fan, but um, if, you know, if you have thoughts about uh, how a gun should be standardized, obviously things like, um, you know, in the API we'll provide a render model so that you know what the physical object looks like. And uh, the API also provides, you know, special coordinates like where various buttons and other controls. So, uh, you know, supporting something fully general could be a challenge, uh, but it's certainly something that's possible with the API. And I guess, what about um, shipping with custom controllers? Is, like, is there any plans for that? Like the, uh, the kind of integrating um, those custom controllers into the, the ship kit, you know? This ah, I see what you're saying. Um, I am not the one uh, shipping, uh, you know, patent steam, um, sorry, VR system packages, uh, but I would suspect that uh, we're gonna target a more general audience with what, what comes in the box. Uh, and that things like, uh, you know, guns or baseball bats, tennis rackets, golf clubs would be available as accessories uh, rather than being packed in the box. But that's just my speculation. Thanks. Oh. Yeah, I was wondering uh, how open the actual firmware for the dev board uh, will be. Can you add on extra software? Or is it pretty locked down with your algorithm and that kind of thing? So it's, uh, it's, it's challenging because um, with, with all the timing sensitivity and the low latency, it's, it's a real-time problem. And uh, if you've worked in an embedded environment, you know that uh, it's a challenge to share those resources. So um, right now, what we're recommending is that uh, Synapse, who's intimately familiar with the hardware, uh, be engaged to, to make modifications. Uh, but we know that that uh, is a restriction that people will chafe at, and we are working uh, toward being able to provide that in a way <clears throat> that would let you make uh, full customization. I think we have some more people in the middle. Hi. Um, so I recall Alan Yates saying a while ago that um, uh -oh, the quotes. base station distance is, like its range is limited to about five meters because of the pulse, um, like the sync pulse. Sure. Is that still true or like, and also can we add in our own sort of repeaters or our own external infrared lights that pulse at the same time that extend our play area to be 25 meters just with huh. less than a meter resolution at the distance? Uh, sure, so um, I mean that is, that is essentially true. So the challenge is uh, if you imagine uh, the base station and the sync blinker, when the blinker shines, imagine it 
casting like a sheet of light that expands through the room. So the sheet gets bigger as the square of the distance because it's growing in height and width. So it gets bigger as r squared. And then the line is only fanning out. And so it only grows as r. And so the reason that he's talking about that limitation there is just that um, inherently, the blinker, no matter how bright it is, will always fall off at a faster rate, ultimately, than the laser. And uh, you know, we've talked about pretty much every one of those options that you've described. But um, right now, uh, you know, just to, to get good lifetime uh, out of the lasers, for example, um, and the, the brightness of the lasers is sort of balanced with the brightness of the sync blinker. Um, and so just making that brighter now won't make the current bases uh, go farther. But okay. potentially in the future, yes, a brighter base can be, can be made. Thank you. And then also, um, are we required to put the Watchman board in our final product, or is that just an option for early rapid prototyping? Good question. So yeah, the board uh, is just an option for rapid prototyping, and all the documentation about all the electronics that are on the board uh, is included. So you have the complete schematics and the BOM and, and the sample layout, which is actually on the module, and that can just be incorporated uh, completely into your product when you're done. I have a question about uh, configuring the uh, photo sensors. Um, how easily uh, will it be, will you be able to customize the placement or the layouts of the photo sensors on a controller? Sure. And also, uh, how many sensors are uh, required minimum to get it working in order? Uh, so those are related questions. Um, like I said, your, your base shape uh, has a big impact on, on how well something's going to track. Uh, and it's, it's a pretty complicated subject, which, uh, but I'll, I will say, you know, bigger is better, obviously. So when you're trying to make something that's small, that's where the challenges come in. Um, you want to have sensors that are visible from every direction, as you can imagine, because you want the, the object to work as you spin it around. Um, and that tends to be what dictates how many sensors you're going to need. So um, once you satisfy having the right number of sensors visible, uh, I sp suspect you're probably never going to go much below 20. Like the dev kit controllers that we shipped in 2015 had 19. Um, the Vive controller has 24. And the headset has 32, which is really, in some ways, overkill. But it, it, it provides a lot of redundancy, because you move your arm and, and your hand around. Um, so you, you do have flexibility in that. And especially if your object perhaps only needs to be seen from one direction, then you could have a lot fewer. Uh, and, and we have tools that, that help you place those sensors. So you can make a base shape, and we'll suggest where you might put them. And then you can make changes to that, and then ask the tool, what would the effect of that be? Uh, and it will give you sort of a heat map of, you're doing well here, you're doing poorly here, uh, and then you can adjust. So that, that is probably the biggest uh, effort that goes into designing a, like a track controller. Uh, because an HMD is pretty big, relatively speaking, so you just put sensors on it, and you're good. Um, whereas a controller, you want to keep it small, close to your hand. Your arm is blocking certain angles. Your hand is blocking certain angles. You want it to be small. Uh, and, and so that's where the challenge comes in. So it requires your own cre creativity, but then we have tools to, to help you measure how you're doing. My quick second question is, uh, are there any feature plans to uh, allow more lighthouses? Um, I know that there's certain interferences that happen when you have sure. more than two. Uh, well, that, that question did just come up. Did, did, was there something about that first answer that? Uh, um, I actually, I guess, missed that question. <laughs> <laughs> well, the short answer is, uh, you know, of course, we're interested in in uh, in allowing more lighthouses, uh, but we don't have anything to announce today. Okay, thank you. Hi, and uh, thank you for the talk. Learned a lot. Um, one of my biggest concerns with creating peripherals like this is, uh, especially with peripherals as large as the hardware development kit that we see uh, right here, is uh, occlusion issues. As whenever you have two people in a Vive using the same base stations, occlusion starts becoming a very big issue. And uh, I suspect when people are creating their own peripherals, that might start becoming even more of a problem. Are there any sort of uh, advancements that are being worked on or that you can talk about to maybe recover from occlusion issues or prevent them in any way? Uh, well, sure. I think the, the number one thing that you can do uh, that, that limits occlusions is just to mount the bases up high. Um, that's why we do it for all of our demos, because that way whoever's helping with the demo can walk around the person getting the demo, and, and the light is coming down over their head. Um, 
I mean, the main way that we are resilient against occlusion is that, you know, once we start tracking, we need very few sensors to keep tracking. I think if you, if you try it, if you just take an object and you try to cover it up and block it, it, it is surprisingly hard. It's surprisingly hard to me, and I know how it works. Um, so uh, I, don't, I don't think that there are any uh, specific plans other than sort of like we said, you know, obviously more bases would potentially help in that regard uh, that I can talk about today. Thank you. Hello. Uh, so a couple questions. Um, one of them, are there any recommendations you have as far as getting the best quality for um, uh, the sensors? Uh, in other words, uh, light bouncing, uh, glass, whiteboards, sure. things like that, uh, minimizing interference. Uh, yeah, well, so we do work in the software all the time uh, to sort of minimize that. Um, if you're designing an object, uh, it, it can certainly be helpful to, to make sure that you don't build it in such a way that it reflects light into itself. Uh, which can be sort of a challenge. Um, again, mounting base stations up high is very helpful because uh, you know the image that is formed by the base uh, is now like down. So the image is you know reflection, and now the the image is down in the floor, and that's not where you are. Yeah. And is there also information on the uh, wavelength of the IR that's being used? I should know that offhand, but I don't. Uh, I think it's 835. 835. Okay. And, and finally, uh, is there any limitation as far as um, uh, the number of objects that can be tracked? I mean, that gets more... No, the I mean, it's just like you say, it. it's just occlusion. You could literally pack the room floor to ceiling with tracked objects, other than the fact that they block each other, because n there's no communication back to the base at all. Like, you, you might think about it because we use, like, Bluetooth to turn it on and off, but for tracking operation, uh, we don't talk to the base at all. So if you think about that, that aluminum-colored original base we had, like, that doesn't have a radio in it. Um, all that does is plug into the wall, and that's it. What I meant was more the, the individual objects that are being tracked sure. that, that need to... Ah, their on, a, on a particular host. So right now, um, the driver just has an arbitrary limit of sort of 16, but that is totally arbitrary, and if somebody shows us a use case where they want way more than 16, then we will change that to fine, recompile the driver, ship a new one, version compatibility, everybody wins, yay. Right, so. Thank you. Uh, one more quick question. Sure, so we, it looks like we have time for one more. Uh, thank you very much. Um, quick, uh, this is related to the first question and what someone else asked, but as it stands right now, it appears that for it to work, you need to have two base stations and need to have reference for each other. Would it be eventually possible to make it, I've heard people have altruistic goals of making it as it, uh, ubiquitous as Wi-Fi. You can have it everywhere and be able to walk sure. around. Would it be, po is it, I don't know how much you can say, but is it possible, even say now with the current technology, to make it more like a mesh network where like you can walk from what it's like one lighthouse or two lighthouse and have it communicate to go from one room to another without losing tracking? I, I mean, that's definitely something that we're interested in. Uh, and I'll, there, there are a lot of parts of the, you know, the core software that support it, and we're working to build hardware that makes that possible. Cool. Thank you. Well, thank you guys for your questions. Thanks for coming.